TV. Me and Ken back at it again. Look at that. I like how that works, Ken. How are you doing? What is it that you like? Uh, we're back at it again, me back and Ken. Back at it again. And then my phone clearly needs to be silenced. I don't know if you could hear that or not. but I hear it, yeah. Really, Things are good. I am well. well how are you? No, uh, uh, I am well, too. I'm trying to mute my phone now since I did not do that ahead of time. Shameful. Shameful. An epic there. battle has ensued. There, now we're all set. Uh, so today we've got a uh, fun little uh, thing, right? The, the day's, uh, you know, the sun's out here. I don't know if the sun is out down there. How's your day yep. going? Yeah, yeah, nice. All right. What do we got? Uh, what do we got going on today? Let's see. Today we have no release notes. That's, uh, that is, I will not say nice, but we don't have anything to read there. But we do have... OpenZD and Engine X, which is very exciting. We have uh, a gracious guest. Shall we bring the guest on? Ken, let's bring Same him in. Do. Here, here, come, everybody, ready? Here comes Andrew. Hey, it's Andrew again. Welcome, Andrew. Hello. It's been a long time. It has been a while. Thanks for joining us today. Going to talk a little bit about OpenZD and Engine X, and maybe some API security type stuff. Is that what we're about? Um. API security is the reason that the Nginx work was was done. It was API security. It covers so many different aspects. There's so many different ways to deploy them. So the real question is, like, if we're going to start trying to put ZD in API security, what does that mean? So one of the first ones is like API gateways, and there's a bunch of those. There's like software. There's libraries. There's so many of them. There's cloud ones. Um, so we kind of looked at some of the cloud ones and came up with ways to uh, work with those. And we I worked with uh, some of the people over in our our DevOps team that are more more used to doing those types of deployments than I am. Um, and then um, libraries I've worked with before, and then also standalone products. But one of the classic pieces of kind of API deployments that has been around for a long time is Nginx. So the question was, you know, what can we do with Nginx? And we've had people take a stab at this before. They've done it different ways. I know one of the team members, I think he's been on ZDTV before, Kurt, he's the one who's working on browser. He's done a backhaul out of Nginx, which is one way to do it. And then we had a former employee who was trying to do basically what I did. Um, and from what I understand, they had some success on that. But this was a stab at trying to make something that would be actually usable in a real deployment. So that's you know, dealing with upstream servers and in dealing with multiple services running at the same time under different identities. So like kind of more of a a bigger solution that was originally tackled a long time ago with like a different version of the the SDKs from ZD, which were much harder to work with. Like actually using the ZD SDKs in this was like, you know, the the ZD lib stuff or uh uh is that the, the socket stream stuff made it yes. so simple so yeah, it was true. it was true. basically dumb once i got yeah. once i got past the nginx fluff and like learning their ecosystem of software development like the zd part was dead simple which was yeah really nice. the zd lib which is a offshoot of the zd sdkc uh that eugene made uh uses this thing called socket pair which he still hasn't come on and talked about i want to see i want to see, see and learn how socket pair works um makes makes it dead simple to use Z uh, for sure. Uh, also, what I wanted to bring you on for is because I was just at the Linux Foundation One Summit, and at that One Summit, uh, something was featured prominently, and we've already kind of engaged uh, this other team called uh, the EdgeX Foundry, and EdgeX Foundry is um, trying to be a a uh, generic piece of middleware between your IoT type devices and your cloud. They have a bunch of microservices and those microservices are currently using an API gateway called Kong. And um, EdgeX Foundry is all about having choices. And so uh, we approached them and said, hey, you know, could we have OpenZD as a choice? And they said, yeah, we love, we love the whole idea of zero trust. Uh, we love the idea of having people have choices. So. You know, I, I am interested in how Nginx might be able to um, work with the existing EdgeX Foundry stuff too, or at least the Zetified version of Nginx. So I'm brand new to all of this. I know, Andrew, kind of, uh, you, you put the, the D for mostly done on it earlier this week, right? 
it is uh, the code was pushed this week to GitHub because it was mostly just living on my my local virtual machines. Uh, all the development was done in Linux. And as everybody uh, knows, uh, developers don't push code until it's done. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was getting pressure. I was like, "When is it going to be done?" And it's like, "Oh, I mean, it, it works. <laughs> it's not. It's not." doesn't have all the features that I want it to have, but it has enough to for people to use it. Shipping is a feature. Shipping is a feature. So it's out there. Um, I did not, I have not gone as far as tagging a release yet. <laughs> or well, I haven't even the, seen it the, in action. So I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, actions. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very interested in seeing how it works. Uh, the, uh, just to bring it back to that edgex foundry idea again, they have a bunch of microservices all sitting inside of Docker containers and um the being able to have uh a, a z-defied way of uh, providing api security as well as having an overlay network like OpenZD provides i think would add a lot to edgex foundry so i think it'll be fun and exciting so i mean i'm interested in being the first consumer of uh that which you have wrought into the world have you uh did you hear anybody talk about envoy at all because that's oh, another of course one. Envoy's everywhere. Yeah. I have Envoy, this to go checked out right now too. Yeah. So, no, um, Envoy, is, little... Envoy is a well-known and well-tried and well-worn pattern, particularly for anybody in the Kubernetes world. Uh, Istio loves Envoy. Istio plus Envoy is a, a big thing. Um, and then uh, recently Envoy has, Envoy has their own kind of uh, um, API proxy. I don't remember what they call it. Uh, it's, it's not Istio, but it was, it's something similar ish. Um, but yes, very familiar. Uh, I've come across it a lot and you see it mentioned a whole bunch. You've thrown and up you look like you. Some, some projects and uh, I'm trying to put these in categories in my head to uh, track the relevance or, or just grok, uh, you know, which problem we're solving. So Nginx, I know it as a load balancer and API gateways. Can you provide a, a distinction? Can you summarize the distinction between uh, the reverse proxy and load balancer category and the API gateway category? Yeah, so they're all kind of related. So they all contain pieces of them. The most the most common piece is the reverse proxy. API gateways and load balancers act as a reverse proxies. So a reverse proxy is best thought of like just generically, like you have some connection coming in and then you're you're sending it off to something else. Right, so at that point you're already middleware, and these are all kinds of middleware. Um, after that, you add load balancing in, so that is like a reverse proxy plus. So you start adding the ability to not just forward it to one server; you yep. start talking about strategies you're running algorithms of sending it. on the the back end for the upstream. Yeah, and so you could be doing things like on Robin, you could be yep. doing sticky, and so you could be taking some intrinsic characteristics of the connections and figuring out, you know, we always send this connection to this server or this client to the server. And then you have API gateways, which is all of that, plus a bunch of features that are usually, you know, the, the word the word that people use is orthogonal. It's like, it's it does all those things, but there's it does this a bunch of other stuff too, which a lot of people don't like to rewrite. So it can start doing things like authentication and authorization. So you can use this as as your 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 sentry point for your connections. So you can actually have mm -hmm. the reverse. Exactly. What it started as a reverse proxy turned into a load balancer and is now making application decisions. You can take all these application decisions that you don't want your APIs doing, like you don't want to write it into every API. So you want or your you APIs want to, to be dumb and just to be able reason. to do work. And so you centralize it forward. Right. And the first place you can put that is on your load balancer. And the second you do that, you start coming up with an API gateway. So API okay. gateways start getting, they start coming down from just like, this is instead of just being a stream of bytes, this is application data that I can interrogate and I can apply rules to. So things you see at this level, like I've said, is security. You also see things like rate limiting. You can also, um, this is where like, if you want to implement uh, API keys, that's kind of part of security, but instead of having to bake API keys everywhere, you can do it at that point. Um, you can also do metrics collection. So you can talk about like, and health monitoring at that point, you can say, okay, when we send it to this machine, we're getting a slow response. So we can alert on right. that, or we can actually drive the load balancer based on, on how well it's working. So you're talking about, mm, okay. you're kind of coming up. So like a, uh, a reverse proxy is kind of dumb. Then you add some yep. smarts to make it better. And then you go full bore and you say, that this is actually sense. going to become, take part of our application so we don't have to rewrite it every time. 
and just use someone else's. So, you know, there's problems with that, but that come up, which is like, you now have this disjointed feeling. So if your APIs were written later and your API gateway was written earlier, so like they might have different feels to them if they have their own APIs, you know, there's like all those, those issues, but usually, usually they're, they're very useful and they also speed up development and, and time to market. So that's why they're, they're pretty popular. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Uh, so I take it, if we're talking about Nginx, we're not trying to stretch the scope of Nginx to include all of that extra goodness that an API get, gateway gets you, which is higher level, more more complete integration with the rest of the application stack. The, the load balancer is, uh, that is Nginx is going to be a comparatively narrow scope. Yeah. The main goal for me that I see out of this is that people already have Nginx or they've worked with before. So if you want to say you have an API, you're like, well, what is it? How will my API work if I put ZD in front of it? Instead of having to go and you know write something yourself, deploy it yourself, or take the SDK and embed it yourself into your existing API, you could just throw this module in into right. Nginx that's potentially already running, and you could just see what it's like. So you can play with ZD with an existing API, with an yep. existing Nginx deployment, toss in a couple of config lines, and then see what it's like. Sounds so easy. Even, I love so it. So Nginx is sort of like sitting on this border between the inside and the outside of the application stack, or on the edge, you might say. And I was picking up from what from your preamble that we're today looking at the outside. Yeah. So this would be essentially, say you have like a, you already have an API deployed somewhere mm -hmm. and you have your stack somewhat secured inside of some kind, you know, like the, the services are hidden themselves and you're using Nginx essentially to front that. So people right. don't directly talk to your service. They talk to Nginx. Right. Um, it, Nginx will basically be taking over all of the incoming. So you can take your Nginx, you can take your, your HTTP sections or your stream sections, completely delete them and only have a ZD section. And you essentially converted your Nginx from being from lit to dark at that point. Okay. So instead of the outside surface of Nginx being exposed to the public internet or some other network, then we were, we could expose it only with ZD. Correct. Okay. All right. Well, that sounds fun. Is, are we, we going to get to see it work today? Yeah, it, we will. But like with all network demos, it's going to see, it's going to see, a, you're going to see a server <laughs> chatting and a client chatting and like, I love it. you know, you're going to have to, yeah. you have to imagine what the applications <laughs> you could do that, what that would, you know, apply to. I made but, the same, you know, I made the same joke at the presentation where I had, I was tailing my, my log and, you know, when the, when the log moves, you can look, you can see it did something, right? Cause the log moved. That's, that's yeah. all you get. <laughs> it's hard to show people what a network looks like. You know, you can add some visualization on top, but like. You know, it could be smoke and mirrors. You never know. But this is, well, you know, real. So, <laughs> well, shall we? Uh, shall we get into it? Do you, do you want to share your screen at all, or you want to just talk about it? Uh, no, I can share my screen. All I'm right. ready well, to share uh, it. So this is that. this is some of the diagrams I was working on today because I need to document document this. But I guess I guess we could back up one second. So there is a repository. It's called Nginx ZD module. It is in the Open ZD project right now. But I was told I need to move it to Test Kitchen. No, 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 no. no. We weren't told that. You weren't told yeah, that at all. Was. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so you can see it. I wrote some. You can see the diagrams. I'm going to go over these in a second, but build, bigger ones. And then there's there's build options. You can either use CMake or you can use the built-in Nginx uh, autoconf features, which is the autoconf features are great. Is that the built-in support for modules, or is that the built-in ZD itself? It's to build the. So this is a dynamic module. So it's loaded. It's loaded when through your configuration. Um, I guess you could technically build it in if you wanted to, but no, this builds the a standalone module that you can dynamically load. Oh, um, builds the module. So, Got it. So uh, yeah. just for somebody who's you know not so bright like myself, what what we're talking about here, it sounds like this is a module that is built for that you can build for Nginx. We don't um, publish it just yet, but I imagine we'll publish it. Is that the idea? Yeah. And then you can download this module, which is does it just come as like a, a shared object or a DLL? Is that what it comes yep. down to? Yeah, I haven't gotten that far yet. There's uh, no releases yet. I need to, yeah, I need to yeah. work on the, the actions. Well, that's, that's fine. Um, and so then uh, a, a person can build it and then a couple of lines of configuration and it'll it'll load the DLL at runtime and or shared objects and, and off and running. Cool. Yeah. My suggestion is to use CMake because I put a lot of time 
crafting custom CMake to to work with Nginx's build system, so that way it's you know this instead of this. <laughs> so Nginx's build system is really great. If you have a really dead simple module, it's it's it makes it really easy to just get something going. The Hello World module is really easy to get going. But the second you start talking about pulling in library dependencies and other things that need to be also built and statically linked inside CMake of your module. is real nice for that. It, uh, Nginx didn't make it real simple. <laughs> so I crafted, I learned to learn a lot about CMake. I'm not a, I'm not a big <laughs> C programmer, so it was a, quite a wild ride for me. Um, but it works. This is actually the way I use it when I'm developing inside of uh, C Lion. So, because C Lion now, has great CMake integration. Does the README here uh, tell me where to put my stuff? Is that what the using section is? Um, so it depends on where you installed Nginx. So you will have to understand a little bit about Nginx's module system, like where they put them and where you installed it to and where you're telling Nginx to look. Um, every system is slightly different. So every I system that meaning undone. operating system? Even just if you compile Nginx, you can install it wherever you want. Nginx could come with your system. They could have one already compiled somewhere for you with its own module directory. Or you, so you could just wave some hands and say, figure out how to do modules. Oh, yeah. You can go <laughs> read the wonderful Nginx documentation <laughs> about yeah. modules. But um, they have That's... a they have di directories they're looking at. I guess I could list the most common ones, but I don't I don't use Nginx as much as I used to in my former API days. But um, OK, cool. You, you should be able to work it out. But yeah, so like actually, this is actually we'll the configuration. See. So this is actually the configuration I was using to develop. Um, it has some. Now this is an kind of, Nginx config block right here. This is an, an entire Nginx configuration for an entire. This is this you can run it all of Nginx mm. with just this. Oh neat. Yeah. So at the top, it's this is loading the Nginx module. Mm. Um, these are required lines. You got to set your logs. This is also required because this module does use threads. So you need to find a thread pool. Um, you have to include this line no matter what. Um, I this is just this is essentially max sizes. I guess you could have more than thirty-two threads, but this is the example amount, which is quite a bit. So if you if you're not familiar with Nginx, Nginx can run without threads and child processes and whatnot. So you can make it kind of run lockstep, which is really great for debugging, but it's really bad for throughput. It's also really bad for like handling a lot of multiple like network connections. All at the same time. Now, so are actually, these uh, are these proper threads and not say uh, like like um, libuv is loop based? You know where the I/O happens on a loop. It depends on how you compile your <clears throat> nginx. Um, so nginx oh. can be compiled without threads or with threads, um, specifically because their their threading model doesn't work on Windows. Um, so if you want to uh, use if you want to do this kind of programming for like in target non threads you basically have to do you know select statements over network sockets and like kind of go through that rigmarole which uh this currently doesn't support windows i was look i looked at and started working on how to add a non thread version using like pre compiler definitions and you know swapping out implementations so that it would work um but it was taking longer than I wanted it to to convert all of the the client and socket buffer of copying and all that stuff and tracking the state differently. So I tossed that out for now just to get this initial version out. So this initial version is only um, uh, only for Linux. And uh, if you want to check to see if you have threads or not, you can use this nginx v, and it'll list all the compile options that were used with it. And you're but you're going to be looking for with threads. Cool. So yeah. So. There's building it, and so I'm just going to walk through. So uh, you do have to desc describe the thread pool. Uh, events is just standard configuration. It's required by by Nginx, and then we have our ZD blocks. And so this is the I spent a lot of time learning how to properly and cleanly r parse it in Nginx configuration because the documentation, while correct, is also very Spartan. Uh, so I spent a lot of time stepping through Nginx code base as it was parsing, but I eventually got this very nice and clean looking block. So you essentially, you can have multiple blocks. So you can, this that one has two. You can have different identities for each one. Um, the actual names that I'm highlighting here, identity one and identity two, those are actually um, 
they're just used for logging. It's just so you can tell like if connections are failing or something's happening in the law in the nginx log. This is essentially the values that'll be output uh, as sentinels, so you can know which things are failing. Um, each block has one identity file. So each block essentially maps to a, a ZD identity. There's nothing stopping you from using the same identity in two different blocks if you want to. Um, and then underneath that is a bind. And so in OpenZD parlance, bind means host, means you're binding to a service inside of ZD. And this is an actual ZD service name. So this has to exist inside of your ZD instance. I was wondering about that. Okay, so you just happen to have the same ZD service name on both stanzas. Yep. And then um, we have our, we also have our upstream inside of here. And so this is right now, this only allows you to have one upstream. So you can only send it to one server. So you, if you want to have multiple upstreams, you have to do what I essentially did here and create two different ZD blocks. You can technically duplicate your binds as well inside of here. So you could have nine binds in here. If you have nine services, you can have nine binds uh, or 10 binds and you can have one duplicated if you want. But I want, I didn't, one of the features I want to add is the ability to add multiple upstreams here and add things like actual load balancing capabilities, round robins, you know, stuff like that. But there's a lot that goes into that and I didn't have all the time to write it. So uh, that's one of the things I want to expand upon. I also want to see if I can actually tie into the backend Nginx upstream processing and reuse their implementation if possible. Sure. But that was all that was all stuff that I would have to go and learn and it would have delayed, you know, pushing out this initial release. But uh, with the facilities that are present, you can get it working by just duplicating your binds or duplicating your identities if you need to. And that's it. That's that's the entire configuration. And so um, I see bind and then service name. Is there a dial service name? No, this does not do backhauling. There's already another Nginx module written by Kurt that does backhauling. And so the thing is, backhauling on ZD doesn't make a lot of sense in 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 having like if you're you're probably only going to do one side of that or you're not going to kind of come in and then go out i guess unless you're like linking zd networks together maybe but so the next question becomes why the word bind bind is the words that is used from that's from open zd that is no, no, literally, I, I get that but it just seems redundant in this uh, stanza you have to have a sentinel token for the nginx ah, configurations gotcha. I, you can't just have you can't just have star parsing here. It, I guess maybe you could, but it, Nginx doesn't, that's not really the way people write Nginx configuration. Well, it's just when I see the word bind, I immediately think, oh, I must be able to supply dial too. <laughs> you know, I, I talked about that. I briefly talked about it with the powers on high and I said, you know, we could probably take Kurt's backhauling and also merge this in here. And the sentiment was leave it separate for now and we'll see where mm -hmm. this goes. I mean, bind could also be service name then and also would be a bit more descriptive, perhaps. All these things and more. Perhaps. <laughs> all right, cool. Perhaps. All right. Uh, so that's that's all great. Okay, so uh, are we, uh, where do we go next? Is there, there's a little bit more readme here. What's left? Oh, a little bit more readme. Um, yeah, it's just basically just screen. goes over the configuration, which I just walked through. Oh, so, okay. So basically all the words I just used are basically oh, yeah. the same thing. Nice. Yeah, right. it just explains the uh, the configuration blocks. So, I mean, so far, this Andrew, is kind it of very easy. You're welcome. Yeah, <laughs> that was the goal. Yeah. <laughs> the goal was to make it dead simple. Um, so now, this is kind of go on. Oh, and, and now I want to get into the where does the security come in? Like, so right there, uh, are you are you simply receiving on a underlay from Nginx? in order to send over ZD, that would be the back call, right? Like I wouldn't expect that's what yeah. you're doing here. The The main security component that you get by using this module is making your making your Nginx dark. Oh. So okay. like, so normally in, a, in an Nginx conf, you usually have like a, uh, an HTTP section, which exposes HTTP ports. This exposes no ports. Mm. See, I didn't pick up on that. So yeah, so like in it, like a typical Nginx will have like H an HTTP, like just like we have ZD here, I'll have an HTTP stanza. And then you'll say, I want to listen on this port and I want to, for these paths and these things, I want to do this and that. And you know, you can start doing HTTP type stuff. 
this essentially has this is a this is an nginx that comes up and opens no ports i see so the the additional security functionality would be like for security integrations and like doing more things like actually looking at the http requests and actually doing more of that kind of middleware type stuff but that would be have to be inside of the http block itself if you want http processing so i was one of the other features I wanted to see is like, can we reuse the HTTP processing outside of an HTTP block? Because they kind of don't make it easy to do that. But I, one of the last things I, um, one of the last things I I figured out was that I can actually get the configuration from any uh, what's called a core module or even internally built module, so I can actually look at those. But I didn't figure that out literally till yesterday. So. So I found so that so I was done. like, "Oh, this is the th this is the thing I was looking for the whole time," and I found it because I was I was reading the core modules because I was there was I had a question and I was digging through it and I said, "What is this?" And I'm like, "Oh man!" But I obviously I didn't have enough time before today to do anything <laughs> with it. Well, that's cool. All right, so we have uh, nginx server that is totally dark. So Correct. if and so if I can, um, I let me try to back up. So if I have already deployed nginx. I could get this new module and then I could uh, add a couple of identities to Nginx and then I could use Nginx basically almost in the way that somebody might use um, a ZD edge tunnel or a edge router, right? Correct. Gotcha. Cool. Now, uh, and then the, the Nginx server would reach out into the overlay network based on those two identities make the terminator network no no to the mm -hmm. overlay network to the edge router it'll it'll the nginx oh, would, the edge yeah, yeah. will reach out to an edge router make that connection okay cool i'm getting it yeah. i'm getting it but those are underlay yeah. upstreams yeah yeah edge, uh, edge routers always have connections coming in on the underlay to form the overlay yeah yeah so this is uh, one of the diagrams I was whipping up this morning and for part of the readme inside of the repo and it's, it's already there, but it basically goes over like what we're actually working with. And so this is based on my demo system. It is actually possible to do something like this. So the server side, it, the server side changed over there in the pink slash salmon slash orange category. You can actually do multiple <laughs> servers. But for my, uh, for my demo, I, I just set up one api server it was just a simple api server that basically just reports the current time and a random number just so like okay not so fast changed. now so we've got on the left hand side i see an api client i see the little zd symbol which means all of that runs inside of zd is that is yep. it, so is it uh a zd sdk on the left then like a zedified application Yep. So a couple weeks ago months a month ago at this point wow time flies i did i did a uh, a, a show HN, show Hacker News, where I talked about how easy it was to replace Go's networking because of the abstractions they put into place. Um, and that included taking, you know, Go's base HTTP modules, which are amazing, and sticking stuffing Z, the ZD SDK inside of it from our GoLang SDK. Yep. So that's essentially what's on the left. Is it's it, the code itself? I can actually show it to you is right here and so it's only basically here there's some argument parsing down here but this is this is all of it basically to send an http request oh there's some rigmarole because it's a test system i just wanted it to go in a loop so i could just hit enter and make the request over and over which is what all this is but essentially what we're doing is we're loading the identity uh the zd identity that is we're using the zd sdk so we're getting what's called a context and then uh, from that context, we can pass it in and get a new HTTP client, which is a Go HTTP client, and then we can just make requests. And so this is this is this is this is all the logic to make the request right here. That, that's it. We have a comment from a viewer. It says awesome work, guys. I wonder if there may be a way to Zedify versus standard access to services at layer seven, like certain URLs are Zedified while certain URLs are standard network. Yep. So that is. So for that comment, so to work at layer seven, we have to have a specific protocol that we're working with. So in this case for Nginx, that would be HTTP. And that's how I was talking about extending the, the actual Nginx module that I wrote to actually be able to be configured inside of that block. 
So that way you, at, at a location, you could say for this location, I want to Zdefy it. But that's, you know, that's a feature I want to add. Like this first step was just getting all the pieces in place, learning, learning Nginx, because I'd never developed for it before. And basically rounding out my knowledge of, of stop making proper, excuses, Andrew. That needs all we need all of it right now. <laughs> properly, there was a lot to learn inside of Nginx. It's 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 so it's so on the outside, like as a user, it's so simple and so fast. But when you dig into like all of the module and configuration work that they put into it, there's there's a lot of details and like knowing. It's not always clear why it crashes. So, you know, it do things like, you know, set up, you know, <laughs> go into debug mode, see where it yeah. panics, step backwards and figure out, oh, it's trying to call this thing that I, you know, I I never set the memory for. And it, that's why it I butchered. crashed. So, yeah. You know, great C programming stuff. But, <laughs> but yeah, but doing it at layer seven. So what I want to do is I can actually add, you can actually have multiple modules defined within one library. So I actually wanted to to go and add another one to work inside of the HTTP section and actually do exactly what um, what the the viewers comment said. So that that would be actually really cool because then you could just take a subset of your server and essentially shunt it over to ZD. So you could you could have public APIs and then you could take a subset of your API and then shunt that over the network. The You're open saying ZD that network. in the in the HTTP core module, then you would be able to define some upstream servers that are. ZD back ZD. Yeah. B based on like URL path or whatever. Yep. Awesome. You can define yeah. that's actually, actually. So in the beginning, when I started developing this, I was using, there's different kinds of modules you can develop. I actually ended up stepping down into what's called a core module in Nginx. Okay. But a lot of the base ones that, because the, the normal use case, most people just want to do an HTTP module. They want to do right. something with the HTTP. So they actually have kind of a, a base module type you can use that gives you access to all of the the http uh, infrastructure you can get you can get yourself down into a request response frame where you actually have just the http buffer uh coming up and then you have a buffer going back down for your response and so that's what the viewers question so like we would need something like that um but didn't implement it yet but that is, that's a feature that would be really great because yeah. then you could have a public api and then part of it could be shunted over a network you can only get to it through a network if you want uh, an open ZD network i should say it sounds like that would also give you the the la the lion's share of load balancing features that is the load balancing features that exist today in the http uh the core module you'd be able to use those to uh you would have to the go down you'd have to go down one more level and, and go into the the upstream module in nginx so so the thing is like in order to get access to different parts of the processing you have to move yourself either to different phases or into different modules of nginx and so there's kind of two options phases is usually easier to do extending an existing module is much harder and you kind of have to play with the internals a little bit and the development could break essentially it makes sense why we're starting where we're starting yes this is much easier and much more stable so uh, so back to this. So on the left, we have a client. The In this example, it's written in Go. Um, and I did that just because of my previous work that I had done with uh, my show HN. And then I have a ZD network set up, which just has one, one service essentially set up. It's called the HTTP service. You saw it in the example configuration. And then on the right is actual Nginx using the Nginx module. And then it's hitting just a, another Go server I wrote. Just It just sits there and spits out a random... Uh, the current time in a random number. So you, you'll actually see. Oh, so it's a, but it's an underlay service, not an overlay yeah. service. Yeah. yeah. So this server, all it, all it does is, is I just switched over to it. Uh, we started up, there's no ZD inside of here. So you can actually yep. expand this. It's just base go. It is a dumb existing service. So the goal was we have an existing service. I need an existing service and here it is. And all it does is current time, random number. And just spits them out. So you can actually, if I run this, I can actually, um, I can actually, I don't even actually know. I'm binding to what 7070. Oops. Boop. Just an HTTP server. So yeah, that's all it does. It just outputs that. So I'm hitting the server. That's just me hitting it this way. I do also have my client over here. And so this is the one I was showing before. It's the ZDHTP client. It's actually going to load this identity. 
which we can actually take a look at. Oh no, we'll see your private key. Oh no, my development <laughs> private key that I have an existing set of scripts that I use to develop in ZD. Like it predates all the wonderful work that uh, Clint and his team have done to you know, make standing up instances easier with quick starts and stuff. Mine predates that it's back in the dark ages when you had to write it by hand. So that's why I have like my own custom directories, but these get generated all the time. But if you want to steal here, here you go. Here's my, here's wanna, my I'm, I'm, I'm typing right now. Type, type, type. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. And then you can also see, uh, we also have a ZD service. So uh, just to, I'm going to make sure I'm going to try and make sure there's not too many smoke and mirrors here. Uh, ZI login is another one of my, custom scripts, all it does is it does ZD edge login with my development server, my username and password and stuff. You can see my development passwords are super secure. Yep. Um, but ZI login basically just does that. So it gives me a token and then I can list my services. Oops. Andrew, why don't I see you with bash completions? I am hitting them. Oh, looks like you're typing the whole thing so fast. ZD, the ZD tool doesn't have them. Heck yeah, it does. Does ZD, it? Yeah, ZD completions bash. Type that right now. A completion, sorry. And then, and then you can source uh, less than parenthesis together. Less than a paren. ZD, uh, a paren. ZD completion bash and paren and hit enter no 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 and just hit hit. Mm, completion no no completion space bash zd space completion space zd space not zd underscore we'll do this later come on do do it right now you'll do it now you'll do it live then what do do i type what do i need completion space bash you just got an extra underbar in there. There, you, there go. you go. Now you can type ZD space. Oh. L. There you go. There you Look go. At the ergonomics. That, there. Now oh, I feel so much better now. There you go. Right. So I, I only have one one service here called HDB service. And so that is where this came from. And HDB service is essentially just going to be forwarding to um, my local host port 7070. That's that's all it does. So, but when, so I do when the, you run this, the the thing up on the top should move, right? Top left, we'll see a new request come in. Um, I'm not actually running Nginx yet. I haven't gotten to that part yet. Oh. I'm just showing the different pieces. Actually, if I run this, I don't think I'm running Nginx right now. Oh, I am. Let me stop this. That's my so, that's my so Nginx. You should get like a no terminators or something. Yeah. Unable, Unable to, to dial, dial servers. Uh, terminator yeah. did not send a public header. Yep. Yep. Yep basically just fails so I, I can't hit it at all um and just to i'm using screen to hide uh all of my my zd router and zd controller so i do have those it's kind of mm. hard to run an overlay network without those yeah so i got my controller here i got my router here so they're just kind of chilling over there so if you you know you do some of this you're going to start getting some chatter saying can't do stuff yep but mostly just sits there and, and complains about errors because there, there's no there's no terminate the terminator is pointed to something that's not running. So I'm running this through here because it's just a lot easier. So I don't screw up my actual Nginx that I sure. have installed. Um, but it's basically just setting up Nginx. I'm pointing to this that config file. Uh, you probably can't read it. That's yeah. fine. And I'm setting some things. I'm setting like the default directory that Nginx is going to run in. I'm also setting where the log files are going to because Nginx, if it doesn't have all these things, it complains. I'm basically just pointing it at this uh, actual, this folder that I'm actually working in. And this is my development configuration. Now, is this all in that Git project? Yeah, all, this? all of this is in there. So, so I could check out that Git project and debug it like this the same way you did? Yep. Um, I did have these I some development flags set. I turned the daemon mode off. Just that's because normally when you run nginx, the first thing it does is it 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 forks itself off into a daemon and then exits. So so if you if you keep starting hard it over to, and over, it's just going to gonna keep. It's hard to debug because you're never going to be attached to a process, and the, <laughs> right. only the first one's going to bind to a port, and then it's going to sit there, and then you're going to be, and then the other ones are going to fail, saying that they can't bind. 
But those processes stay alive because that's Nginx's default behavior is just to sit there and wait because it doesn't know what the modules that it's running are doing. So it just happily sits there saying, I can start this server and the process sits there. So the first time I ever tried to debug this, I had about 50 Nginx is running. <laughs> I, didn't know <laughs> what was going on. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Nginx runs right. in daemon mode by default. <laughs> and then uh, master process off, this basically stops uh, Nginx from starting up a bunch of workers because that also makes it very hard to debug. So if you're going to use this in a in a kind of a real environment, you want to you want to remove those those two. Uh, but this looks very similar to um, the example that's in the readme. There's a thread pool. And then this is my my stanza. And I'm basically just have this one host file. Uh, sorry, host identity, and then I'm binding to the HTTP service, and I'm saying forward, shunt it over to localhost 7070, whatever, whatever that is. And so I actually start this, and I'm I have um I have a uh, debug on, so there's going to be a lot of chatter. If you run this without uh without the debug flag set, you're going to get much less chatter. But we can see that um we can see the ZD SDK is outputting information. Um, probably should shunt that over to a different file, but it's currently just in line with the Nginx also logs. Also right not now. legible for what it's worth. Oh. Oh, hey, oh, oh now I feel better. Thank you. Yeah. That melt, that but you can see it says it's initializing uh, my ZD instance name used for cool. logging, which is right here. Cool. And I spelled instance incorrectly. But, and it also says, you know, it's it's it offloading service start for block whatever the name is, and then the service. So nice. that means that it read it, it, it figured out it could use it, it connected, it authenticated, and it found the service. And it didn't um, crash. So, and it didn't crash. So just sitting there waiting. <laughs> cool. Um, but So but now, now, we now can, it'll work. Let's hope. Yep. Of course not. Why would it work? Good demo. Good demo. <laughs> Good demo. Let's see. Let's see. I mean, sometimes the... Uh, Boop. Oh, I think I know what happened. I'm only using one edge router, and there's a bug where if you connect as a terminator and then you disconnect and it's shunting over just that one edge router, it's not forwarding it over the mesh, uh, the terminator doesn't get cleaned up properly. And that's what happens because I stopped it when it was running um, after Ooh. it had already connected. So there's a, there's a bug, oh, but that's it. a different issue. Maybe. Probably just log it and let Paul fix it. <laughs> Perfect. But it's, it only happens when you're using one edge router. So that's what I'm doing. So we can actually okay. see uh, we're actually getting the time and the random number coming oh, back. Yeah, and they are changing. It worked. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Nice. It's just, yeah, it's just because the uh, the Terminator didn't get updated. And so it was forwarding it to something, a socket that basically was was disconnected. That's the, that's the bug. I see. But. Well, um, the quick start does uh, only install one router unless you use the Docker Compose one. So it is possible that I've hit this bug in the past and just never figured out how. Yeah, it's if you if you let it sit there, it'll eventually time out and it'll fix itself. So basically, mm. you just you just wait, and then eventually the um, the Terminator will clean itself up. But like, there's just a delay on the timeout before it realizes the socket's dead. People are not as patient as machines. No, they are not. <laughs> I so yeah. So we got it. Yay, it worked. And then if I go over nice. here and I shut Nginx down, I'm just gonna kill it real quick. Let me go no back. And we'll see. And it starts failing again. Yeah. It's dark. It worked. Nice. Um, but yeah. Well, that is exciting. Uh, is there more to see? No, I mean that's that's the full set of features. It's the full set of configuration that we currently have. The I have personal goals that I would like to do in this project, but of course it comes down to, you know, resource management and all those <laughs> bigger decisions. Um, there's a, another project that I'm eager to get started on, which is Zag, ZD API Gateway, which is essentially going to be an, a full, well, it'll start as a small API Gateway that essentially allows you to do um, API Gateway things, which includes what Nginx can currently do, but it's going to be written in Go. Um, there's already a, there's a couple of small API gateways already written in Go, some libraries. So I'm going to probably get some inspiration from those. And um, I've already written an API gateway from scratch before in Node.js, and it was tons of fun to write. Um, but it was a private, closed source thing for an enterprise company I used to work for. So it is it is hidden in the mists and it will never be recovered. But if I was going to write an API gateway today, I wouldn't write it in Node.js anyways, because once yeah. uh, that project got sufficiently large it got very difficult to to refactor because this was pre typescript taking over the world well we'll um, we'll you... leave we'll leave our our 
JavaScript opinions to ourselves right now. Yeah. But the <laughs> API gateway itself will be able to do, it'll be able to act as, um, I wrote, wrote, I wrote some internal musings that I haven't really released or put on in a blog post out there, but talking about uh, different ways to do security integrations. And so one, to do real security integrations, especially when you're dealing with like brownfield development, where you know you bring in ZD and as the green part, and then you got some old dirty stuff sitting around. It just works. Yes. Yeah. Is doing things like um, signed HTTP headers, so we can forward the ZD identity as a as a form of proof. So as long as you you trust whatever the API gateway, I also want to do it in Nginx, but I want to come up with a standard for how we send over uh, signed headers that assert ZD identities. Um, so that way backend services can just trust the headers coming down to them because that's they could only be generated and signed. Yeah. So that's acting as a, the name I'm coming up, I use it for as a authentication proxy. It's not like yeah. some fancy cool word. I mean, we'll probably have to do some cool open source branding, you know, call it thunder or something. I don't know. Thunder <laughs> security, you know, maybe dinosaurs is later security. Rubber Z D rubber stamp. Yeah. But you know, for HTTP, it's interesting because then we can we can assert the identity where we are terminating um, the overlay network, but essentially yeah. still have our underlay network be able to carry the ZD identity downstream. So HTTP headers are, are one way to do that. Um, proxy uh, authentication proxying also allows us to do things like front database connections. So like this is all kinds of things that are already out there and already have been done. Um, so teleport kind of that's what teleport does. They basically act as a authentication proxy. Well, that was really cool, Andrew. Thank you so much for coming to the ZDTV, showing us the uh, initial offering of tying ZD into Nginx. I think that was really cool. Uh, I'm going to try to play around with it myself and see if your README actually works. So uh, that'll be fun. <laughs> Give it to actual you see the actual <laughs> test. That's right. I, actually, you know, go 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 the hard path. You actually use the no, nice. Nginx build tools. <laughs> I like the easy. I like it easier. Um, but yeah, that'll be our ZDTV for the week. Uh, thanks again. Thanks uh, for hanging out, Ken, and chatting, asking good questions. And we'll see everybody next time. See ya. <laughs>